along the ancient course of the Nile River and in the bit of the Sahara Desert that lies between some of the most famous of the ancient Egyptian sites, in the desert between the iconic Giza Plateau and the only slightly less famous area of Saqqara, lies two of the rarely seen and really least well known of all of the Old Kingdom sites, the Pyramids of Abu Sir and the nearby Sun Temple of Abu Jarab. This is a follow-up piece to my recent video on Abu Sir. I wanted to share a look at the much smaller yet equally amazing nearby site of Abu Jarab. Not only is this just a spectacular place with some truly astonishing ancient objects on it, and these objects are rarely seen or visited by tourists, but both Abu Jarab and Abu Sir are home to some of the very best examples that you can find anywhere of ancient machining, and some clear evidence that some form of ancient high technology simply must have been employed here at some point in the distant past. When you visit these sites and you first notice the machined surfaces, the precision objects, when you see all of the tube drill and the circular saw marks, the question arises in your mind. Did the dynastic Egyptians really do all of this work? Or did they possibly inherit some of these objects? Did they renovate some of these sites? And did they respect and revere the work of their forebears much as we respect and revere this magnificent work today? My name is Ben and you're watching Uncharted X. I hope you'll join me as we take a brief look at some of the astonishing evidence for ancient engineering and high technology at the Old Kingdom Sun Temple site of Abu Jarab in Egypt. Before we get started here, just a little bit about the premise for this video. If you want to hear a summary of the reasoning behind why I think that the idea of ancient high technology and lost ancient civilizations is not only plausible, but an idea that's becoming much stronger thanks to a lot of new science and new discoveries that have happened in the last 20 years, I'd recommend watching the Abu Sir video that I referenced a second ago. The link for that is below in the video description. Or if you prefer a slightly longer version of that reasoning, I'd recommend watching my channel introduction video, The Case for Rewriting History. As I'm not going to cover this ground again in this video, I want to get right down to the site and to looking at the evidence for high technology. Abu Jarab is something of a small site. You could almost consider it a satellite to Abu Sir. And this site wasn't actually a pyramid. It's not even thought to be a tomb or anything like that, even by mainstream archaeologists. This is an obelisk site. It was known as the Sun Temple of Nusara. The structure you see here isn't actually a pyramid, it's the base for what was a just giant obelisk at some point. The obelisk is no longer there. To get to this site, at least every time I've gone there, we've gone there from Abu Sir, and in one case we actually found somebody, a cousin of a cousin, who had a jeep at the back of the site. And I know that a lot of the driving footage that I show in my videos can be kind of scary and of these crazy moments in Egyptian traffic, but this was one of the drives that we had in Egypt that was just awesome. I, uh, I just, this was an amazing experience to be able to do a little bit of four wheeling in the dunes and have a pyramid view. It was just an outstanding few minutes of driving that got us over to Abu Jarab. You can actually see here the pyramids of Giza on the horizon. We're actually looping around to the far side of Abu Jarab here, and you can see that as we pan around. It's not exactly a small structure, this base for the obelisk that you can see here. I have to imagine that the obelisk that sat on top of it that's no longer here must have been just some almighty big piece of stone. Obelisks in general are just remarkable pieces of precision engineering. I haven't talked about them very much yet in my videos, but they also tend to come to us from the very oldest sites, the oldest parts of the Old Kingdom. We forget about how many of these obelisks there really are, as many of them have been removed and they've been shipped off overseas. There's a whole bunch of them in Europe, in the United States, they're all over the place. And these have been tremendously difficult for us to move, even with post-industrial age capability. Many of these obelisks have been broken in transport. They've been broken trying to box up. There's even one or two, I think, that are on the bottom of the ocean having sunk along with the ships they were on. There are some reconstructions of this site that estimate what it might have looked like, including the obelisk. There are granite casing stones scattered all around the base of the obelisk. 
which was supposedly put together of multiple pieces of limestone, although who really knows. As most other obelisks are all single piece, and there's certainly evidence for larger obelisks than this, the largest of which is of course the unfinished obelisk that still lies in the quarry at Aswan, which is 500 miles away. This unfinished obelisk is estimated to weigh around 1200 tons, just a huge amount. And I've got to imagine that even if this obelisk at Abu Dhabi was smaller, we're still talking about a piece of stone that could conceivably weigh 500 tons or more that has to be shipped from the granite quarry in Aswan 500 miles away. That's quite an achievement. Other than the base to the obelisk, the site itself has kind of been jumbled up and there's been lots of things moved around from their original location. The main features on this site are really the, the base for the obelisk as we talked about and then there's some just astonishing structures that are made from alabaster or they might be made out of white calcite, I've, I've heard them described as both. Travertine is another possibility. In any case, all these different stones I just mentioned are for sure much softer and easier to work than substances like basalt or granite. But I'm not sure it really matters when it comes to the machining marks that are left behind. Hand tools would leave a much different signature to what you're going to see on these objects which just have machining marks and power tool marks all over them. One of these objects is just the incredible multi-block hotep that has a circular plug in the center and I don't think this has been moved from its original location, there are still floor tiles underneath it. This thing is considered to be an altar even by mainstream Egyptology as this wasn't considered a tomb, again it was considered to be a sun temple. I've visited this place at sunset a couple of times and I've been able to spend a little bit of time actually sitting up on this hotep and I can tell you at least from my seat of the pants experience it certainly feels like a sacred place if for nothing else than just considering being in the presence of something that's really so magnificent and so ancient and at least that's been my experience. It's one of my favorite places and I really greatly look forward to visiting again at some point in the future. The construction of this hotep is actually very interesting. It's quite clearly been shaped with the repeated use of a tube drill. You can still see the marks that were left in the stone by this tool. We've got striations that are visible in the material from the cut. We've got little overcuts that are still in the corners of the hotep. And you can tell that the drill cores after they've been drilled out have been removed and then most of the surface has been polished. And I think this was the primary function for all of the tube drill marks that we see on ancient sites, at least as far as I can tell. In most cases, they were simply used to remove material. You can see how tube drills were used to remove material with the marks that are left in this box that's in the Cairo Museum that has very small tube drill marks into it. There are also boxes and constructions with very large tube drill marks like this piece. Even inside the box that rests inside the so-called King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid, you can find tube drill marks on the inside where they've been used to remove material and a tube drill was used just a little too close to where they wanted the wall to be and the mark wasn't polished out. There are also small tube drill marks around the rim of this box that have been filled up with some substance like wax, I think. Another feature of the Hotep is the central round plug. In my opinion, its sides have quite clearly been machined. On one side of this central plug, there is a very clear saw cut. It might be a circular saw cut that's been made into the side of this plug. This is very similar to many other saw cuts that we see all over ancient Egypt, particularly Giza, and you also find them at Saqqara and Abusir. The other notable feature on Abu Jarab are these just astonishing series of carved bowls. I don't really know what to call these. They are somewhat notorious just for the sheer amount of evidence that they contain that points towards some form of ancient high technology. You can see that these blocks have been machined from large chunks of alabaster or travertine and that they've been pretty clearly shaped with tube drills just all over the place. I think tube drills have been used to form the outer curves on the top of these shapes, they've been used to remove the material in the center. And also, as you can tell, every block actually has a pretty well cut tube drill hole that goes into the middle of the bowl itself. Naturally, according to the academics and Egyptologists, these are only ceremonial. They're labeled as sacrificial bowls. It doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense to me given the location of the hole in the bowl. It would be hard to actually fill it up. I'm not sure what purpose the hole serves. It seems to me that the precision that is evident in the construction of these bowls hints that they were likely functional at some point in the past, although it's really hard to tell now they've been moved around. These aren't the only bowls that are on the site, there are several more. 
And some of the machining and faceting that's gone into some of these blocks is quite amazing. The surfaces are just exceptionally smooth and the angles are very sharp. It's actually quite a, an odd feeling when you run your hand between what is obviously that smooth polished surface and the rough surface. The actual polished and smooth surface is the higher level of material. It's almost as if they were cut and they were transported with these machined surfaces but then for whatever reason those were rubbed away to give you that rough surface. It's, it's really weird that that's the higher level of material, the polished surface. But that is what it feels like to me when I put my hand on it. Also evident are several machining marks, not just in the tube drills, but from the saws that were used to actually cut and machine the fine surfaces. These bowls are quite unique. You don't see really anything else quite like them anywhere else in Egypt. Their shape is very interesting and it's a possible relationship that I'll explain further in my resonance video, but this is actually the shape that you would be using when you would build something like a sonic levitation device. We can actually create these today. You can, if you have a 3D printer, you can make one yourself. And the shape of lots of the components are actually very similar to the shapes that you see in these bowls here. I'm not saying that's what they are. It's just an interesting coincidence when you look at some of the science that is behind sonic levitation. There are also some differently finished bowls around the side of the base of the obelisk. These aren't the same as the ones out the front. They don't seem to have the cog-like appearance. They're more of a smooth finished bowl, but they're also very interesting. I think some of these are actually carved from limestone as well. I find these bowls to be extremely just fascinating. At least to me, they certainly seem to belong in the list of out-of-place ancient objects along with the boxes, the precision statues, and some of the slabs and megalithic walls that we see on so many ancient places around the world. There certainly seems to be a lot of possibilities when you really consider any functional nature of this site, these objects, and even the sites that surround it. To me, it seems quite possible that all of these Sunbelt Pyramid sites are somehow connected. You can see each pyramid off in the distance. I think there is a tremendous amount for us still to find under the sand. Indeed, as we pan around from the top of the obelisk base at Abu Jarab, you might notice some circular shapes under the sand. I've been to this site over several years and these circular shapes, these depressions in the desert behind Abu Jarab are always there. So I think we're actually looking at something that's probably buried. Who knows how much there is to still be discovered under the sands of Egypt. Well, I hope you enjoyed that brief look at Abu Dhrab. I really wanted to get this out quickly after my Abu Sia video. It's kind of a natural follow-on because it's something of an extension of that place. I still have more work to do looking at other aspects of Abu Sia. Funnily enough, I know that Brian Forrester has also produced videos this week looking at these two sites. I think that's great. The more people that are showing these places and talking about them, the better. I'd uh, encourage everyone to head over to his channel and check out his take on these places as well. I actually did the same thing that I did for the Abu Sia video here. I ended up actually writing out and scripting quite a long investigation into the history behind the drill holes, the tubular drill marks that we see on so many of these sites. And it goes back to Flinders Petrie's day. And there's been a lot of different opinions and papers and work published on these things. And again, I didn't really want to tuck that in behind what's essentially a site visit. So there's a lot of content coming this week over the next few days i'll be publishing that video on its own as well as the evidence for lathes in ancient times particularly when it comes to all of the stone pottery that we see in museums i also sat down yesterday for about three hours and talked with antonio zamora who's one of the leading independent researchers and scientists looking into the younger dryas and in particular he's been instrumental in getting a grip on what's happened with the Carolina Bays. It's just a spectacular story if you've not heard of that. So that's a whole interview, probably a two-part uh, interview that I'm going to release. So I've got a lot of work ahead of me in the near future. I'm going to try and publish most of those videos this coming week. Uh, so if you like that idea, please do head over to unchartedx.com support to read about how you can support the channel and help me to put the time into making these videos. I try to run everything I do on the value for value model. There's lots of ways you can help me out and I very much appreciate all the people that choose to do so. Uh, it, it really is making a difference. So thank you. And I will see you guys in the next one. Peace.